So uh, we, we, the reason for the bug fixes were that, you know, okay, we kind of screwed up a little bit with version two with the impedance matching of the analog front end. So uh, version one actually had a, we had, well, version one was just on proto board and it was a complete, it looked like Frankenstein, you know, it was just, you know, little wires everywhere. Um, but the point is with version three, um, we, what we actually have now is it's really pluggable. And we decided to take the same kind of modularity principles that you have for software and now implement them in hardware. So what we've got is a, essentially a backplane. It's actually like if you think about a PC, how you have like motherboards and little like baby boards that you can plug in. It's the same thing now with the RFID Guardian. So you have a whole lot of connectors. Here in the middle you still have the, uh, the FPGA. We're now using an Altera FPGA. But now you have a place where you can plug in the analog front ends. See, this is a good thing, not just because, you know, if you design an analog front end and completely screw up, you, you know, you can just unplug it, redesign the piece that's broken, and then plug it in again. But it's also handy because not only can you design an analog front end, let's say for high frequency RFID, like 13.56 megahertz RFID like we showed in the video, but you can also do uh, 125, 135 kilohertz analog front ends like you would have, for example, for the VeraChip that people inject into their arm or, you know, the little chips that you put into your, your pets, you know, fluffy, you know, your dog, cat, fish. Um, also, uh, 860, 960 megahertz. If any of you guys have ever heard of EPC Gen 2, this is also one of the kinds of RFID that is, I mean, like the Department of Defense and Walmart are going crazy over this one. <laughs> uh, we want to be able to support it too. It's certainly one of the largest standards. Um, but it requires yet another analog front end. Of course, someday we hope to integrate these things, but for right now, we're still sort of in the phase where we're trying to get everything to work. So, <laughs> um, so for right now, pluggable is really handy. Also, uh, there's a lot of RFID at uh, 2.45 gigahertz. I'm sure some of you are familiar with RFID in uh, containers and, and, and uh, pallets and a lot of things where you really need a longer range RFID. Also active RFID tags, the, one, the kind of RFID tags with batteries. Those also operate at uh, UHF at 2.45 gigahertz. So we're also working on building an analog front end for that. So, so that's really handy. We also have pluggable uh, uh, bits for, you can see up there at the top, there's a place you can put a TFT touchscreen. Right now we have a, a double E student who's uh, working on developing a, uh, a board for that. Um, we have a whole bunch of GPIO pins just so you can add your own random stuff. Um, there's also a JTAG header which is useful for debugging the hardware. And up in the corner, it's a little hard to read here, I'm sorry, but there's also a place where you can put a Bluetooth module. Now, I know you guys are going to recoil in horror at, you know, this is supposed to be a security device. Why on earth do you want to use Bluetooth? <laughs> this is true. Uh, the reason why we want to use Bluetooth is because if, if we have one of these devices, you don't want to uh, constantly be futzing with the thing. <laughs> I mean, you just want to be able to, like, maybe put it on your belt and forget about it or just put it in the corner and forget about it. And our, our idea with Bluetooth is that you can basically whip out your cell phone if you want to make any changes. Use actually the user interface on the cell phone to basically make whatever changes you need to. You know, put your cell phone back and then you're done. And this is actually what we've implemented and I'm going to show you some very pretty photos. But uh, yeah, in terms of uh, Bluetooth, that, this is the reason why we are using you know, SSL over Bluetooth. Because <laughs> um, we don't want to deal with uh, those security issues too much. But yeah, but that's sort of the idea. And actually our grand vision for the RFID Guardian is that eventually you could take the analog hardware that we have built and put it on one chip. So what we have built, uh, just in terms of you know, an RFID reader and an RFID tag emulator, a software-defined radio at its essence, is not much more complicated than near-field communications, which is also a sort of RFID. This, Philips has already put NFC on one chip. Uh, Nokia has already put the NFC chips into phones. And we think that you could do the same thing with the RFID Guardian. Minus the antennas, of course, which you'd have to plug in. These things uh, you can't reduce. Uh, or you could reduce them, but then the operational range would become worthless. But this is sort of our vision. And also that kind of helps, you know, with the you know, whip out the cell phone, you know. It kind of gives people, people the idea of where we think this technology maybe someday could go. So, all right. Um, here's actually a picture of the Bluetooth module uh, that we made. We're using the Linkmatic uh, Bluetooth chip for that. We're also using uh, Nokia cell phones, so we're using the Nokia E60 and E61, and you can actually see a picture now of uh, our main menu that we've implemented. 
Um, first of all, I also want to say I'm covering a lot of, ter uh, uh, a lot of territory really quickly here. Uh, we actually just recently submitted a very new, a very new uh, research paper <laughs> on all of this. It hasn't been published yet, but uh, well, we're hoping it's going to get accepted to the conference we sent it to. So at some point, uh, a lot of this information will be available as soon as the paper is accepted <laughs> uh, in a publication. But I also should say that a lot of this information is also available on our website, which is www.rfidguardian.org. So you can all, I mean, so if you want to know more, for example, about the uh, user interface on the cell phone, there's lots of information right now that's online. So, all right. So uh, version one was Frankenstein. Version two had, you know, uh, our bug fixes. Well, with version three, we, we were finally deciding we want to make this a little bit more professional. So we actually got this now produced in, uh, in China. Um, right now with this particular version of them, we have uh, uh, 10 of them actually that we've been prototyping. We have seven of them assembled. Um, and if you, well, this is the PCB. And once again, you can see the whole like motherboard baby board idea. Because here is the back plane. And here uh, are all the different baby boards. So in this corner, you have uh, the board that you plug the tri little Triton module into. Above here, you have some uh, power management circuitry. Next to that, you have a, a sampling board for AD conversion. And along the top, you also have a, uh, actually, look at the screen so I can, yeah, you have an RS-232 uh, board for the serial cable. You have uh, an oscillator board. You have uh, the JTAG board. And also in the uh, upper uh, right-hand corner, you basically have a little user interface board uh, for uh, three LEDs and three buttons, because everybody likes blinking lights. So if, uh, if we assemble it, this is what it looks like. Uh, once again, we're still uh, in our prototyping phase. We're still just trying to make sure that, uh, that everything works. Uh, it, you're going to notice that version 3 is larger than version 2. We had different objectives with the different versions. I mean, version 1 was like, let's prove that this works. Version 2 was, let's make it cute for the photo. <laughs> and now with version 3, it's sort of like, well, OK, let's you know, make it work again so we can really do rapid development with this. And I have to say, um, we're also going to soon be coming out with a version 4 that we're going to try to make cute again and then hopefully uh, actually be able to mass produce and sell to people. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, at the end. So but this is version 3. So OK, you've seen our beautiful hardware. What does it actually do? Uh, tag spoofing. Uh, you, I believe, uh, saw this. No, actually, you didn't. Uh, I have another video on my on my website that shows tag spoofing. So rfidguardian.org if you want to see the video. But uh, if you want to know how to spoof RFID tags, I'm going to give you like a really quick uh, overview on how to fake RFID tags. So this is sort of the canonical photo of what a uh, what an RFID tag signal looks like. Essentially, you're going to have a peak here around the baseband. So this is 13.56 megahertz uh, in uh, well the system that we're using. And on either side of it, you have these two little peaks that are called sidebands. And essentially, how RFID works is it has a little load modulation resistor. And essentially, the RFID tag just flips the little resistor on and off in time with the clock signal. And that's the way that it uh, transmits data back. So it's then the job of the RFID reader to filter out this, because this is just uh, information that the RFID reader itself is sending. So it knows this stuff already. So it, it doesn't care. So it just wants to filter out its own signal and just get these two little bits of information right here. And uh, the timing of you know, how these little peaks are sent is completely dictated by uh, the standards. And the standard could be the ISO standards. It could be EPC standards. Um, but basically, what we do now with the RFID Guardian is you're going to notice here, uh, this is the carrier signal. So this is 13.56 megahertz. But now you're going to see two really whopping big peaks. In fact, this peak on the left here is even bigger than, uh, than, the, than the carrier frequency. <laughs> and these are actually our sidebands <laughs> that we're producing. So why are the sidebands so big? Well, first of all, we are actively transmitting the sidebands, while our RFID tags only passively <laughs> you know, cause the sidebands to happen by um, modulating the RF field. So essentially, because we are actively transmitting these frequencies just with a normal transmitter, the, the operational ranges of the RFID Guardian are much, much, much larger <laughs> than what you could expect from an RFID tag. Simply Sorry. Uh, simply because we're operating with different principles. Oh, I think I broke. Okay. Well, anyway. Oh, hold on. 
Oh, sorry. You don't. Oh, how did you? I don't know. You can't. Yeah, you, yeah, you totally cannot take me anywhere. It's just, uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> so, side bands. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, with uh, so uh, essentially we can get uh, well right now with uh, yeah the the largest um, operational range that we have seen so far with 13.56 megahertz is uh, 60 centimeters, uh, which isn't huge, but we're still working on optimizing this uh, with our current analog front end. Theoretically, with uh, HF RFID, you could get it up to two and a half meters. <laughs> um, in terms of LF, it's probably going to be smaller. In terms of UHF, it's definitely going to be a lot bigger. <laughs> so, really, the answer of how 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 long is the how how long can the operational range of the Guardian be? I mean, the answer is, for the most part, it depends on the frequencies that you're using. Uh, of course, keeping in mind that with the RFID reader that's attached to the Guardian, that that's actually going to have the greatest range limitations because if you're trying to uh, communicate with RFID tags, it's the tags that are going to have the real limitation. So with RFID tags, if the nominal reading range is 10 centimeters, we can't do a heck of a lot about that unless you want to, you know, put so much power into this thing that you can cook, cook pigeons with it, but I'd rather not. So. Right, so tag spoofing. So uh, here's how it looks when you spoof. Uh, you can basically see we just uh, made a whole bunch of really fake looking tags. So a whole bunch of zeros, F0, zero, F0, zero, F0, zero, F0, zero, F0, F0, zero, F0, 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 one, et cetera, et cetera. So we have spoofed successfully so far. Well, we weren't really being methodical about it, but we were just like playing with it one day and we were like, how many tags can we spoof? We got up to about 200. <laughs> and then we said, okay, that's, uh, that's probably good enough. Another thing we can do is uh, spoof and jam at the same time. So another kind of cool demo that we have is if you uh, have the RFID guardian, and this is really fun to play with, you can have uh, you know, two RFID tags sitting on the reader. You can have your guardian. You can actually put the guardian next to the reader, and all of a sudden, one of the tags will suddenly uh, change into another tag ID. So it'll actually spoof one of the tags that are there, or sorry, jam one of the tags that are there, and then replace it <laughs> with the tag ID that you're spoofing. So it's like all of a sudden, you, know, you put it closer, you see the little ID flip, you put it away, that flips back, you know, it's kind of fun to play with. So this is uh, one of the things we can do. Selective jamming. So we can jam both RFID tag responses and also RFID reader queries. So I'm going to talk first about how we jam, uh, the select, I have to say selectively jam the RFID tag responses. So with ISO 15693, which is uh, as good a study as any, uh, it uses an anti-collision algorithm called slotted aloha. So anti-collision, for those who don't know, is just a simple uh, way that if you have multiple RFID tags and you ask them, okay, tags, who is here? You need some kind of an algorithm to prevent them from all saying, I'm here at the same time. So essentially what you do is you just assign 16 time slots and you have the RFID tags more or less uh, pseudo randomly generating uh, a time, you know, picking a time slot based upon actually what they're doing is XORing their tag ID with something called an anti collision mask uh, with, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and it's using that to, to pick the, uh, the time slot. But it, it sort of seems pseudo random when you're doing it. So because there's an algorithm that we understand that they're using to choose the time slot, all we have to do is for any given tag that we want to protect, we have to calculate the particular time slot in which it's going to be speaking. So we know, we can calculate based on the tag ID, if tag 1234 is my passport, <laughs> I mean, I know then that, uh, you know, in time slot, in, time, in uh, round one of anti-collision, that it's then going to be speaking in slot 14. So then in round one, you send out a jamming signal. And when I say jamming, I literally mean signal warfare jamming. Like we are just sending out random noise to increase the, you know, noise to signal ratio <laughs> uh, high enough that uh, essentially you you just can't plug out, pluck out the tag response anymore. And, uh, and then it blocks uh, any tag response in uh, slot 14 or whatever it was. However, then it, uh, if uh, the reader detects a collision, it goes to the next round of anti-collision. All of the tags that really are there and aren't being protected then in the next round choose a different time slot. And the point is that the RFID reader will actually go through 16 rounds of anti-collision uh, before it gives up. So, I mean, essentially, uh, at that point, you have a 16 to the 16th chance of, uh, <laughs> of actually, uh, you know, jamming tags incorrectly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, which means it's probably not going to happen. 
so uh, in such a way, we can actually always get uh, RFID tags uh, to be jammed uh, by just simply calculating when they're going to speak and only jamming that time slot.